Dr. Fabio Cortesi is a lecturer and research fellow at the University of Queensland. He's an expert in sensory neurobiology and evolution, specialising in how marine animals see their world. Fabio hails from the Swiss Alps but fell in love with the ocean and its inhabitants when pursuing an honours project on the colourful displays of Australian nudie branches over a decade ago. His long-term goal is to understand how animals see their world, use colour to communicate, and how this shapes communities and biodiversity, especially in light of recent dramatic changes to the underwater environment. His group studies vision in fish, cephalopods, and crustaceans, focusing on the deep sea and coral reef ecosystems. He frequently engages in outreach activities, bringing the wonders of the underwater world to the general public. Fabio is also a consultant for several blue-chip nature documentaries, including Sir David Attenborough's recent documentary, Life in Colour. All right, welcome everyone. Before I start uh, talking to you about what fish can see and what animals on the water can see, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners um, of the land and especially the sea country on which many of the animals I'll show you today were collected from. So the Angurumungo and Tanu people, which are the traditional owners of Lizard Island, which is on the northern uh, farther Great Barrier Reef. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and an emerging. And I would also like to reiterate that it is from the traditional owners, really the first ecologies of the land, especially of Australia, that we will still have a lot to learn. Uh, and they will also they're the ones that know best how to preserve the land um, going forward. All right, so um, I lead a group of quite a few folks, uh, quite a few PhD students, um, a few postdocs, and our main interest essentially is to understand how animals see the world. Uh, it is not only underwater animals, we also study how, how birds see the world, for example, how different mammals see the world and how a lot of insects get around. But, um, uh, but the marine realm is really what I'm passionate about. And so if you look at vision, and I'll just give you a quick vision 101. This is back to your high school biology course. So if you look at vision in vertebrates, we have this camera style eye, which is needed to see. Um, and so from the front, the light enters through the cornea, the lens, it goes through uh, a vitreous and then it hits a retina at the back of the eye. The retina is a, is a multi-layered cell structure that contains uh, different neuronal cells and then the photoreceptors on the back. Generally, we distinguish between cones and rod cells. Cone cells are used during the day and they're used to see in color. And rod cells are used during the night and they're, they're essentially highly sensitive. Um, in invertebrates, the eye looks a little bit different. We were looking usually at a compound eye structure, such as in this uh, mantis shrimp, where um, we have a lot of so-called omatidias, which are long cylindrical cells that within themselves have one single photoreceptor. So we essentially have a, a lot of different photoreceptors that are not in one layer, but each of them have their own little lens and they all capture the light separately. However, both systems essentially within these photoreceptor cells, um, they contain a protein, which is called an opsin. And uh, I guess most, most of you would have experienced when you were growing up, you would have had mom telling you to eat your carrots. So opsins are, are proteins that bind a vitamin A derived um, chromophore crystalline structure. This structure can actually absorb light. And so the way um, this structure is bound within the protein um, essentially gives you the spectral sensitivity, makes the photo, makes the pigment sensitive to different wavelengths of light. And the advantage of having sensitivity to different wavelengths of light is that we can start distinguishing color. So say we have a photoreceptor that is only sensitive to green. Uh, if we were to look at the world, we couldn't see, we could see everything pretty much in, in, you know, black and white. Uh, if we have a second photoreceptor, we can start making out a few colors. And then if we add a third photoreceptor, in this case, a red one, we can start distinguishing many different shades of red and green in this case. I am actually a color scientist that is colorblind. So I'm pretty lost on the third, third panel, but yeah. Um, there's ways around that, fortunately, uh, for me anyway. So yeah, so having color vision, awesome. It allows us to um, pick out ripe fruits. It allows us to choose a mate. Uh, and in these days, it allows advertisement to be very, very efficient and effective. So underwater, however, um, color, color is a bit different to what we are used to uh, on land. 
And this is where our interest comes in to study vision in fish, essentially. So what happens is that underwater, the light environment changes quite rapidly. So if we are in a clear uh, water environment, such as the open ocean or on a clear coral reef, um, essentially the water, the wavelengths, the shorter wavelengths and the longer wavelengths get absorbed fairly quickly. So if you go diving, if any of you guys are divers on here, and you cut yourself at about 10 meters depth, your blood will look green because there is no red light left over. Um, and so this means that fish living at different depths or in different light environments have evolved eyes that function best essentially for the light environment they're in. And this often includes colors and light that we cannot see. So if we look at this fish, we would say, yeah, well, just another yellow bob, just another other yellow fish um, uh, with our eyes, right? So we can see red, green, blue, as I showed before. And for us, this is pretty much a yellow fish. Um, but if we look at this fish through a ultraviolet sensitive camera, we see that it actually has a lot of patterns that reflect in UV. So we are not able to see ultraviolet light, uh, mainly because it causes a lot of damage to the retina and we don't want to go blind. Um, so our lenses filter it out. But these little fish, a lot of them can see UV and they use UV to communicate with one another. So they have these different patterns on the face uh, and they can actually tell their neighbors apart based on differences in the pattern. Um, so the way we study fish vision or animal vision in general and how they can see is that we look at both the genes, so the proteins, the opsins, we look at the physiology and we look at the behavior of the animals, both in the lab and in the field. I uh, much prefer the field component of this whole story, but unfortunately these days I sit behind the laptop and uh, write stories up. Uh, for most of my time. But yeah, so the way we can study this in the lab is that a lot of these critters, a lot of these creatures are actually quite smart and they can learn really quickly. So for example, we can teach something like an anemone fish to go and pick a dot from a screen. And so we can teach it to pick any dot on the screen and we can change the color of the dot and we can see how long they can, they're still able to see it. So we can teach them to blue and we can change the color to green or to red or to yellow. And as soon as they cannot see it anymore, they will go randomly. We can do the same with crustaceans. So with these uh, mantis shrimps, for example. So in this case, they were taught to grab a cable tie with a specific color and drag it in. And we can also do this with octopuses. So in this case, we taught this octopus again to go and reach a cable tie. Now, octopuses are actually quite cool. They're um, colorblind, and it's a completely different story. So I'll focus on fish today, but if you have any uh, questions about octopus vision, just shoot them through on the text line. All right, so one story I want to tell you about is uh, how Nemo sees its world, essentially. And this story um, was worked on or developed mostly by two of my students, uh, Dr. Laurie Mitchell and Valerio, who is writing up at the moment. Uh, we also participated in a book that was written on um, how on on um, uh, anemone fish more generally, and it's a it's a pretty cool story if you're interested in it. Um, so why Nemo of all things? Well, a everyone knows of them, so it's an easy one um, to to talk about and and bring to the public and bring awareness to. But the second reason is that they usually live, so they live in a, in a mutualistic relationship with anemones and the anemones themselves um, bleach as well. So when the, when the ocean, when the ocean heats up, um, not only the corals tend to bleach, but the anemones as well, and they start dying off. So what happens is that the anemone fish are stuck to their anemones. They can't really leave. And so they, they essentially bear the full brunt of climate change. The third reason is that um, anemone fish change sex, which makes it very interest interesting in terms of vision. So the, the smaller individuals are males and the biggest individual is the female. If you remove the biggest female, the second biggest fish in line will turn into the new female. So uh, Finding Nemo had a few things wrong. Um, Papa Nemo would have been Mama Nemo by the end of the movie and she would have kicked him out of the anemone, essentially. Um, yeah. Um, so anemone fish um, also do a lot with color. So they communicate quite a bit with color. And so we know a lot about their visual systems. And one thing we know is that they can see very well in ultraviolet. We didn't quite know why. 
So why would they need this amazing ultraviolet uh, visual ability? And so if you look at this picture, we have an anemone fish in human visible on the left, and we have this, well, another pair of anemone fish on the right, which are seen through a UV camera. And as you can see here, the white stripes are quite, they stand out, so they contain a lot of ultraviolet in them. Everything that's black essentially absorbs UV, everything that's white reflects UV. And so what we found is that um, when we go to another species of anemone fish, in this case, the gray barrier reef anemone fish, we found that if we measure the color, the reflectance of this UV color uh, on their stripes and generally on their body, then we see a difference in the brightness of the color uh, in different sized individuals. And it is especially the, the smaller ones, so the, the lower ranked individuals, that seem to be brighter in UV. So they have this really bright UV coloration, which we cannot see, but the fish can. And so we were wondering if they use that to talk to each other and to communicate rank, essentially. And what we did is we, we made a Nemo Fight Club. So what we did is we had two anemone fish. We made a, we put a barrier in the middle and we put one fish under full spectrum light that contains UV and a second fish under, uh, had, uh, also under the light that had a little umbrella that would either filter out the ultraviolet light or it will filter out or it will make the whole area darker. Because we didn't know if it's just a UV component or if it's, it's the light environment in general that changes um, behavior. And so we did this over and over again, and we essentially staged the two fish against each other. Now, an enemy fish are quite aggressive, and if they're the same size, one of the two will immediately attack the other one to, to a certain dominance within the anemone hierarchy. And so if we do this over and over and over again with different individuals and with different combinations of the filters, what we find is that um, the little ones essentially always lose. And so even if we size match them, the ones that have more white, they always lose. So they use this really bright white UV color to signal that they're submissive. And so when a bigger fish comes or even a fish of the same size that's darker and ultraviolet, the one that's really bright essentially submits straight away. And yeah, it's similar to essentially waving a white flag and it tells us what UV color does in this circumstance. So this is a cool way to test the importance of colors underwater for these visually interacting fish. Um, but of course, um, the oceans are changing and we saw a lot of this already tonight. Um, it's not only changing in terms of uh, the water quality itself, it's getting warmer, um, corals are bleaching, and there's more sediment runoffs, there's more storms. And a consequence of all of this is that the light environment, the visual environment for animals changes as well. And so when the visual environment changes, the animals essentially have two, two options. One is they stay and fight, or the other one is they try and move and go, go somewhere else where it fits um, their vision better. And so if we just look at a few facts for the Great Barrier Reef, um, itself, and this is taken from the Coral Watch homepage. So if you're interested in contributing to um, monitoring bleaching on coral reefs, then go and check this site out. Um, coral Watch used to be run out of our lab, they've gone independent now, but yeah, they do an awesome, awesome um, job with bringing uh, bleaching um, to the general public and you can contribute a lot if you love snorkeling or diving, go and have a look. So anyway, so back to Great Barrier Reef. So it's our, our jewel. It's more than 2,900 reefs. You know, it's about the size of Italy. Uh, the, the net value, this is from 2019, is about, is estimated at being about $6.4 billion, uh, dollars a year. Um, the annual Australian economic, social and, and uh, income value is 56 billion. It creates 64,000 jobs and so on and so on and so on. It has a lot of visitors at the moment. And especially in recent years, it has been facing many threats. Uh, the main ones are big, big storms, more severe and more frequent storms, um, crown of thorn, uh, starfish outbreaks, and then coral bleaching, which I've mentioned before. The main causes for this is us. So um, human-induced climate change due to climate warming, essentially. So I won't go into the detail how bleaching works. If you have any questions regarding that, um, just shoot them through on the on the um, on the comments. Um, but yeah, in the last 
20 years alone, we have had four massive collision events. Uh, and this is quite impressive because we can't really see any widespread bleaching from before 1998. So in 98, we had the first big bleaching event, which was associated with an El Nino year, which made everything warmer. And then in 2002, we had another one. And then 2016, 2017, we had back-to-back -back bleaching events. Uh, it bleached again a little bit in 2020. And this year, unfortunately, it's a very, very warm year, and it's predicted to bleach heavily. Again, it has to do with an El Nino year, and so the waters are warmer for us here in Australia. It's going to be drier, uh, and the water is going to move less. And so the surface layers are going to heat up a lot, and we're all preparing mentally for that event to happen soon. Um, so what happened essentially is that in, in those bleaching events, we've lost probably well over 65% of the coral cover so far. Um, in certain regions, it's around 80 to 90% that was lost. There is good news. Some of the corals are coming back and they're actually growing relatively fast. Uh, but again, the problem is that these bleaching events are happening more and more often. And so, so the impact keeps happening. So what does this mean for the visual environment of fish? So as I said before, um, we see more and more of these big, big um, storm events, which can cause flat plumes. This was a flat plume, plume in uh, Townsville from a couple of years back when they had their big floods. Um, it can cause sediment to be to be stirred up just because we have more cyclones. Um, it, it can yeah, create all sorts of havoc. We also have more algal blooms, so water is getting greener. Um, but one thing to point out is that variation in the light environment has always been there. And especially there's always been, been there between seasons. So hopefully these animals are able to cope with these changes, even if they're happening more often, hopefully they can change with the chain, with, uh, they can adapt to these changes to a certain degree. So what we did is we set out and we wanted to test whether these animals essentially can adapt their vision over very short time periods. This process is called phenotypic plasticity. And most of this work was done by another student of mine, Abby, uh, which is shown up there in the corner. And she looked at this in two different uh, reef fish families. One are the damselfish, which uh, Nemo belongs to as well. Um, they're the most common fish you'll see out there. They're all these little jobs that swim around. They're very important for reef structure, to keep the reef healthy. They feed off the algae of the coral. They try to grow over the corals. They also serve as, as essentially food for bigger fish. And then the other ones were um, surgeon fish, which again are a very important family uh, for coral reefs. And what we did is we we measured um, the light environment and the water up on Lizard Island on the Northern Great Barrier Reef. Uh, we, we also started a long-term monitoring program to see now how the light environment shifts over time. And this is done together with Neil Canton from Ames. Um, and we collected a lot of these fish and we looked at the expression of the genes that make these opsin genes under different light conditions and between seasons. And so what we found is that we see very different answers to changes in light environment. The smaller fish, which tend to be more side attached and they cannot move much, they seem to be very plastic in their expression. So they seem to have a very big adaptive scope to changes in their light environment. Whereas the bigger fish, the surgeon fish, that generally move around already a lot anyway, they don't seem to be that plastic. So what does that mean in the long term when the environment is changing more frequently? Well, it gives us some hope that the little ones can stay and survive at least for a certain period of time. The big ones, the bigger fish that usually move a lot anyway, they might just move off and try and find a new habitat. So it's really hard to predict overall how this is going to influence uh, the reef ecosystem and the biodiversity of fish. But generally, there is some degree of plasticity, and that made us quite happy. We didn't know that was that was happening um, to begin with. So then the question is, what can we do to counter all these changes on the water? And so because we see, see, we've seen this bleaching happening over and over again, and we see that the habitat is being lost, we've started recently this project called um, the Nemo Hotel Project. And essentially what we're trying is because the anemones bleach and die, the, the anemone fish lose their houses. And what we're trying is to build artificial structures to essentially um, substitute anemones as homes, or at least the structure where the anemones can live on. And so this is one of these 
artificial prototype structures that we're building. And unfortunately, there's still a lot of plastic in there. So we need to work on it. This is just the first prototype. But essentially, it's this pagoda style hotel that we built. Uh, and then we seed it with an anemone and an anemone fish, and they should then use this as their new habitat. Other things that can be done, and again, this is from the Coral Watch homepage, is that we, as ourselves, can reduce the impact we have on the environment. And of course, the big companies are the big polluters, but if all of us um, change even a little bit, a lot of drops make up an ocean in the end. So this is also from a couple of years ago, uh, but essentially we can take measures to, you know, reduce water consumption as we've been seeing before, change our aircon habits, recycle, reuse, and essentially reduce, uh, which is probably the most important out of the three. Uh, we can eat less meat, especially red, wheat, red meat, adjust our transport needs, adjust how we go on holidays and so forth and so on. So again, I recommend you go and look up the Coral Watch homepage. They have a lot of helpful tips on how to mitigate this. And yeah, that's it for me for today. Thank you very much.